In this lecture, we're going to be talking about how systemic diseases affect the eye. Let's begin by discussing diabetes. There are two types of diabetes. In type 1 diabetes, it is thought that there is an autoimmune disease against the pancreatic beta cells. The pancreatic beta cells, as you remember, create insulin. And without your pancreatic beta cells, there's going to be a deficiency of insulin. Type 2 diabetes is thought to occur as a result of insulin resistance. It is associated with obesity and the American diet. These differences are important to note because those with type 1 diabetes are diagnosed very soon. However, those with type 2 diabetes are diagnosed late. What I mean by this is there's not many years between development of disease and diagnosis in type 1 diabetes. Whereas, in type 2 diabetes, there's oftentimes many years before the patient is ever diagnosed with diabetes. This leads to a difference in clinical presentation. Type 1 diabetics are rarely seen to have diabetic retinopathy at time of diagnosis. Whereas, type 2 diabetics are oftentimes seen to have retinal changes when they are diagnosed. There's been enough time elapsed for the changes to occur. This, just not, this is just not the case in type 1 diabetes. It doesn't matter what type of diabetes that you have. The retinal changes that are often seen are microaneurysm formation. An aneurysm is a dilation of a blood vessel seen here. The lumen is small and then gets enlarged and then small again. Aneurysm formation is the hallmark of diabetes in the eye. The exact pathophysiology of these aneurysms is not known. There are several different theories. Nevertheless, these aneurysms form and they are leaky and sometimes they bleed in the eye. Now I've added a diagram of the eye and the retina so that we can understand how these bleeds affect the eye. If the aneurysms bleed within the retina, the blood will be trapped. It can't go anywhere. On physical exam, we'll see what we call dot blot hemorrhages. Focal areas of hemorrhages. If the aneurysms bleed on the inner surface of the retina, there are no constraints to the bleeding. These are known as flame-shaped hemorrhages. In the area of the macula, it is common for the vessels in diabetic retinopathy to leak. As fluids develop under the macula, there is a distortion of the macula. This leads to changes in the visual acuity of the patient. This is what is called diabetic macular edema. There are two different types of diabetic retinopathy. There's non-proliferative and there's proliferative diabetic retinopathy. The difference being that in non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, there's no neovascularization, whereas in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, there is neovascularization. Neovascularization is a formation of new blood vessels and is mediated by VEGF. Due to the leaky blood vessels and lack of perfusion to the peripheral retina, VEGF is created in the retina. This leads to a formation of fragile blood vessels. In this diagram, there's ischemia of the peripheral retina. This leads to increased VEGF. Increased VEGF leads to the creation of new fragile blood vessels along the surface or inner surface of the retina. The formation of new blood vessels occurs on the surface of the retina, but it can also go to the iris and cause neovascularization there. This will lead neovascularization of the iris can lead to clogging of the angle and increase intraocular pressure because fluid can't drain through the trabecular meshwork. This is what we call neovascularization glaucoma. But let's get back to the retina. As I said earlier, the vessels from neovascularization are fragile. They are easily torn and bleed. The blood has no place to go but inside the vitreous. This is what we call a vitreous hemorrhage. Acutely, this poses a problem for the patient because the patient cannot see. More chronically, this bleed can form fibrous tissue. This fibrous tissue causes a connection between the vitreous and the retina. This is not good and leads to vitreomacular traction, or traction on the retina from the vitreous. Oftentimes, this is a cause of retinal tears and retinal detachments from previous vitreous hemorrhages. 
Let's go over some clinical images of diabetic retinopathy. Here's the funnest without diabetic retinopathy. An early picture of diabetic retinopathy is seen here. You can kind of make out some microaneurysms or some dot blot hemorrhages here. It's hard to see. In the mild case, you can see exudates. There's a flame-shaped hemorrhage there. And perhaps some dot blot hemorrhages are barely visible. As we progress, you can see there's more exudates, more microaneurysms, and dot blot hemorrhages. In this picture, you can see neovascularization. Look at those vascular changes as compared to fundus without vascular changes. Now compare it to the normal. You can see there's more branching in these arteries. Now here's a picture of vitreous hemorrhage, what I was describing. These fragile vessels tend to bleed. In this final picture, we can see vitreal retinal traction bands. As I described earlier, the hemorrhage likes to reorganize and becomes a fibrous connection between the vitreous and the retina. With this added fibrous connection, it's easy for the retina to tear or become detached. 